This video is brought to you by Boney Wright, an educational animation channel that goes through a variety of topics like psychology or economics. Recently, they've produced several medical videos such as a history of the first vaccines, a case about horned rabbits and its link to the human papillomavirus, and their latest upload about the mechanics of how viruses work. Check out their channel in the description below. In 1894, the assassination of the French president Marie-Francois Sadi Carnot by an Italian anarchist triggered a chain of events that would lead to some of the most remarkable breakthroughs in surgical medicine of the 20th century. Carnot ultimately succumbed to his knife wound due to the severing of his portal vein. At the time, surgeons had no technique that could successfully reconnect blood vessels. This left a lasting impression on a young French surgeon named Alexis Carrel who would ultimately go on to develop new techniques for suturing blood vessels. Inspired by sewing lessons he took from an embroideress, Carrel's technique of triangulation used three stay sutures as traction points in order to minimize damage to the vascular walls during suturing. His method proved effective in protecting against post-operative hemorrhages and embolisms, as well as in preventing strictures at the site of the suture. Carl's experimentation had resulted in many successes with reconnecting arteries and veins and performing surgical grafts. His discoveries had laid the foundation for modern vascular surgery, leading to his Nobel Prize in 1912. In the 1930s, Carell would once again make medical history. Working with famed pilot Charles A. Lindbergh, he developed the perfusion pump, an apparatus that allowed living organs to exist outside of the body during surgery. The groundwork for both open heart surgery and organ transplants was now established. Fast forward to today and over 100,000 solid organ transplantations are done every year worldwide, with the majority being kidney transplants. Across all solid organ transplant procedures since 1970, it has been estimated that 2.3 million life years have been added, with the median survival among recipients being 12.4 years compared to 5.4 years among those on the waiting lists. Beyond these relatively common life-extending procedures, some surgical pioneers have proposed that both the understanding and technology already exists to go beyond simple organs, that we may be ready to transplant the human head. Interest in head transplantation started early on in modern surgery, though it would take Alexei Carrel's breakthrough in the joining of blood vessels or vascular anastomosis to make the procedure feasible. In 1908, Carrel and American physiologist Dr. Charles Guthrie performed the first attempts at head transplantation with two dogs. They attached one dog's head onto another dog's neck connecting the arteries in such a way that blood flowed first to the decapitated head and then to the recipient's head. The decapitated head was without blood flow for about 20 minutes during the procedure, and while the transplanted head demonstrated oral, visual, and cutaneous reflex movements early after the procedure, its condition soon deteriorated and it was euthanized after a few hours. The next milestone in head transplantation research would come during the 1950s as a result of work done by the Soviet surgeon Vladimir Demikov. Demikov is known for his notable contributions to the field of transplant surgery, especially thoracic surgery. He improved upon the methods of the day for maintaining vascular supply during organ transplantation and was able to perform the first successful coronary bypass surgery in dogs in 1953 with four dogs surviving for more than two years from his surgical techniques. Demikov would go on to attempt his own canine head transplant procedure in 1954, improving upon Guthrie and Carell's techniques. Demikov's dogs demonstrated more functional capacity and were able to move, see, and lap up water. His more successful outcome was attributed to his careful preservation of the blood supply to the lungs and heart of the donor dog. In his technique, an incision was made at the base of the dog's neck, exposing the jugular vein and aorta, and a segment of the spinal column. The small blood vessels were then exposed, drawing a tight knot of thread around each one. Finally, the spinal column was severed. Though the head was effectively amputated from the dog's body, it still maintained the use of its heart and lungs through the main blood vessels, 
Finally, the main blood vessels were then connected with the corresponding vessels of the host dog and the head attached. The dogs were able to survive 29 days from the procedure, though ultimately they succumbed from the immune response of the recipient to the donor. Because of the lack of immunosuppressive drugs at the time, there were no effective methods to manage reactions between the donor and recipient. Furthermore, Demikov focused only on the vascular system and made no attempts to reconnect nerves, making the process clinically unsuitable for use in humans. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, advances in immunosuppressive drugs and organ transplantation techniques offered new tools and methods to overcome some of the challenges faced by previous head transplantation attempts. In 1965, Robert White, an American neurosurgeon, began his own controversial research. However, unlike Guthrie and Demikov, who focused on head transplantation, White's goal was to perform a transplant of an isolated brain. In order to accomplish this challenging feat, he developed new perfusion techniques which maintained blood flow to an isolated brain. White created vascular loops to preserve the blood vessels and blood flow between the internal jaw area and the internal carotid arteries of the donor dog. This arrangement was referred to as autoperfusion in that it allowed for the brain to be perfused by its own carotid system, even after being severed at the second cervical vertebral body. Deep hypothermia was then induced on the isolated brain to reduce its function, and it was then positioned between the jugular vein and the carotid artery of the recipient dog and grafted to the cervical vasculature. White conducted this procedure on six dogs with mixed results. Survival times varied from six hours to two days. During the procedure, White monitored the viability of the transplanted cerebral tissue and compared the activity of the transplanted brain to the recipient's brain through continuous electroencephalogram monitoring. He also kept track of the metabolic state of the brains via an implanted sensor that measured oxygen and glucose consumption, demonstrating that the transplanted brains were in a normal metabolic state after surgery, suggesting the functional success of the transplants. A few years later, using techniques employed in his previous experiments, White performed the first head transplantation in primates. Done with a set of four isolated monkey heads and isolated monkey bodies, White employed direct suturing of the carotid and jugular veins. In the recipient body, the fourth through sixth cerebral vertebrae was removed to accommodate the procedure. Due to the subsequent spinal shock and drop in blood pressure following transection, the drug catecholamine was infused and mechanical pulmonary support was used to maintain heart function throughout the experiment. White also utilized immune suppressing drugs to prevent the occurrence of hyperrejection reactions in the monkeys. After only a few hours after surgery, each transplanted head was able to chew, swallow food, track with eyes, and bite from oral stimulation. Post-surgical electroencephalogram monitoring also showed that the heads exhibited a characteristic awake pattern. Ultimately, revascularization remained the largest challenge to White's procedures, limiting the primate's survival to between 6 and 36 hours. Constrictions would develop in the jugular vein at the suture line, impeding blood flow from the head. Continuous infusion of the blood thinner heparin was used to counteract this. However, this ultimately led to blood loss and death. Like previous experiments, White did not address the fusion of the donor and recipient spinal cords, focusing only on the vascular system. This was a major limitation of his method as it required mechanical respiratory support of the body. These experiments were criticized in the media and were considered barbaric by animal rights activists. Because of the backlash from White's work, few animal experiments on head transplantation were done in the following decades. It would not be until 45 years later for the next major breakthrough in head transplantation to occur. In 2015, using mice, the Chinese surgeon Zhao Ping Ren would improve upon the methods used by Robert White by utilizing a technique in which only one carotid artery and the opposite jugular vein were cut, allowing the remaining intact carotid artery and jugular vein to continuously perfuse the donor head throughout the procedure. Because only one carotid and jugular vessel were cut, Ren's method was able to maintain adequate blood pressure during the entire procedure while simultaneously minimizing trauma to the recipient. Electroencephalogram recordings from both the donor and recipient heads after surgery 
demonstrated normal electrical activity with over half of his mice surviving for periods longer than 24 hours. Ren's revascularization protocol, unlike previous attempts, allowed for longer-term survival with the longest surviving mouse lasting six months. Once again, because no attempts were made to connect the nervous systems of both mice, Ren's process still relied on the recipient mouse's brain for breathing. However, due to the lower spinal separation, the donor's brain stem still remained intact, offering the potential for independent breathing. To date, all attempts at head transplantation has been primarily limited to connecting blood vessels. However, the recent developments of fusogens and their use in the field of spinal anastomosis or the joining of spinal nerves has opened up a potential solution to fusing the nervous systems of the donor and the recipient during transplantation. These fusogenic agents refer to polymers like polyethylene glycol, polyxamers, and polyxamines that have the ability to fuse the membranes of cells together. In 2004, a team led by Dr. Richard Borgens at Purdue University demonstrated their effectiveness by treating paraplegic dogs with polyethylene glycol injections within 72 hours after their spinal cord injury and found that more than half of the treated dogs were able to walk within two weeks of treatment. Though it should be noted that there are significant differences between canine and human spinal cords, as well as the nature of the compression spinal cord injury in the experiment, which is vastly different from the transection performed during head transplantation. In 2010, limited success with polyethylene glycol nanoparticles as a fusogen was also demonstrated on guinea pigs with spinal cord injury, though similarly on compression injuries, not transection. Around the same time as Ren's research, Italian neurosurgeon Sergio Canavero also put forth his own head transplantation protocol that not only addressed reconnecting a spinal cord, but was specifically designed for human head transplantation. Canavero's protocol is based on acute, tightly controlled spinal cord transection, unlike what occurs during traumatic spinal cord injury or simply surgically severing it. He postulates that a controlled transection will allow for tissue integrity to be maintained and subsequently recovery and fusion to occur. His proposed technique claims to exploit a secondary pathway in the brain known as the cortico proprio-spinal pathway. This gray matter system of intrinsic fibers forms a network of connections between spinal cord segments. When the primary corticospinal tract is injured, the severed corticospinal tract axons can form new connections via these propiospinal neurons. With a highly controlled transection of the spinal cord that inflicts minimal damage to this gray matter, he believes that functional recovery can be achieved in humans undergoing a head transplant. In Canavero's surgical protocol, two surgical teams must work simultaneously in order to accomplish the procedure. Both the recipient and donor are intubated, tracheotomized, ventilated, and stabilized into a rigid fixation. ECG, EEG, monitoring of oxygen saturation, body temperature, and hemodynamic monitoring are all established. The recipient's brain is then put into an inactive state known as burst suppression with the use of barbiturates or propofol. The recipient's head is then subjected to profound hyperthermia at around 10 degrees Celsius using a technique known as autocerebral hypothermic perfusion, while the donor's body only receives spinal hypothermia via perfusion of subdural and epidural spaces with cold solutions. This is done to lower the metabolic rate of the organs and tissues. Each patient's neck is then carefully prepared by the two surgical teams. First, the carotid and vertebral arteries and jugular veins are exposed and all muscles in both the recipient and the donor are prepared and marked for later linkage. The trachea and esophagus are then surgically prepared through cervical incisions. The laryngeal nerves are also prepared. Next, both the recipient and the donor are placed in a prone position. The vertebral bodies are transected and the dura is cut, exposing the spinal cord. Under microscopic guidance, the spinal cords in both patients are then transected with an ultra-sharp microsurgical blade. The recipient's head is then separated, drained of blood, then flushed with iced ringer's lactate in order to avoid coagulation complications. It's then rapidly transferred onto the donor's headless body and attached with tubes that connect it to the donor's circulation. 
Spinal stabilization is then performed with a plate, and then the two spinal cords are immediately fused with chitosan polyethylene glycol glue, reconstituting the cell membranes damaged by mechanical injury. Simultaneously, polyethylene glycol would be infused into the donor's blood, supplying the intravascular space as well as promoting better neural fusion. Sutures around the joint spinal cords would then be applied and more polyethylene glycol would be administered intravenously after 4-6 to six hours. The vascular connections between the recipient and donor is conducted by bypassing blood external of the carotid and jugular vessels while they're sutured together. The donor circulation would now provide blood to the recipient's head. The dura is then sewn and a spinal cord stimulator is secured to the dura. The spine is then further stabilized with a screw and rod system. The trachea, esophagus, and cranial nerves are then reconnected, and finally all muscles are linked and the skin is sewn. The recipient is then taken to intensive care with a cervicothoracic orthosis brace, completing the surgery. One of the most overlooked issues by head transplant researchers is that of pain. Canavero has acknowledged that the development of central neuropathic pain is a possible post-operative complication following head transplantation, though it could be dealt with through a selective lesion in the suprarietal white matter that targets the sensory component of chronic pain. This procedure, however, is still very experimental, with no clinical studies showing that this would actually relieve symptoms. In 2015, Valery Spiridonov, a 33-year-old Russian computer scientist, who suffers from a muscular wasting disease, became the first volunteer for HEAVEN, or the Head Anastomosis Project led by Canavero, becoming the first man to sign up for a head transplant. However, soon after the announcement, he withdrew from the experiment, citing falling in love as the reason for the change of heart. Canavero's research and subsequent plans have drawn massive criticism for being ethically dubious, with his home university in Turin ultimately even rescinding his contract, forcing him to move his research to China, though he has since reported that he has moved heaven out of China and that the research is now unfolding elsewhere in an unknown location. Despite the collaborative efforts with Canavero, Dr. Ren insists that he primarily wanted to focus on repairing damaged spinal cords and not necessarily a full head body transplant. Beyond ethical concerns, others cite the lack of research in the relevant literature. Only a few independent papers have been published with the majority of them being opinions or surgical techniques under testing. Experimental data are almost absent, leading to significant doubts into the feasibility of the procedure. Despite these criticisms, Canavera and his collaborators remain persistent in their research. After all, the initial scientific and public reaction to the first kidney and heart transplant was also seen as playing God and violating the rules of nature.